What is this? Hey, everybody, and welcome to Show and Tell. It's uh, me, Lady Ada, with me, Mr. Lady Ada. We're broadcasting live uh, from downtown Manhattan in our secret lair. But uh, it's not about us for the next half an hour. We're going to check in with people from around the community and see what they're up to, what code they're writing, what 3D printing they're doing, what uh, augmented reality they're inhabiting. Uh, we've got a lineup of all sorts of Adafruit peeps, as well as many people from the community. Come on by. We have space for everybody. We'll be here till 7.50 or so, and then we're going to jump out and do our um, Ask Engineer show right afterwards. So let's get right into it. First up is Sean. Hey, Sean. Hello. Oh, with, the, with the sporty bow tie. What are you up to this week, uh -oh. Sean? So I made probably the worst audio volume indicator in the world. It's, it's the Rube Goldberg of audio indicators. So as you can see, uh, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And anybody who's done hardware would just be like, well, yeah, that's like what eight components to do what is like a rectifier and then an envelope detector. And then yeah. like, yeah, you light up an LED. So okay. I'm, I'm running several threads in the ESP32 in order to make this happen. That's okay. <laughs> and you it's really 555 or you could right. use right. Threartos. Okay, so what's what you're using threads? Yes, yeah, so if I'm going to share my screen for a moment here and explain what's going on because this is part of my free Artos or Artos series that I cover general concepts um, for a set of videos for DigiKey. And I'm going to share this, and hopefully we can see my little slide here that I've made. Hooray! Okay. And what I've got going on here is I've got an interrupt service routine. So that's something in hardware on the ESP32 that's sampling the microphone. And that's the little electret, you know, amplified microphone that we've got here that Adafruit mm -hmm. sells. And that's sampling it at 16 kilohertz. Now, the ESP32 apparently is bandwidth limited to about 6 kilohertz. So uh, forgive that. I just wanted to try something at 16 kilohertz. So you can sample that fast. You just lose some of the high frequency stuff. That's feeding into a double buffer. And I have two tasks. One of them is reading from that double buffer every time one of the buffers fills up with like yeah. 1600 samples and computes RMS. Like this could be your fast Fourier transform, your machine learning thing, whatever. It's a task that runs at a lower priority than what I have here is task B, which is managing something else. And in this case, it's a serial terminal. Um, and it's just, you know, echoing whatever it sees. And the idea here is you could use an RTOS to manage several tasks and you should really only consider doing multi-threaded stuff when you need to do several tasks at the same time. That's yeah. the big concept I'm trying to get across here because sometimes people are like, oh, you should use multi-thread. And you're like, do you really need it? Like, this is a case that demonstrates when you might need it. Like you're sampling, doing something at a lower priority and you still need to have good user interaction or good user interface that's like yeah. a serial terminal or you know neo pixel giant display and you can't miss timing for those so that's when a real rtos or excuse me a, a real-time operating system comes into play um also funny funny fact the isr the interrupt service routines takes like 20 percent of my cpu it's i know perfect. you're like you're like why does it take so long but like the whole chip has to be like okay stop everything like destroy the house i'm in build a new house okay Right. Exactly. And if I were to do it again, I'd do it with DMA. I'd do it with direct memory access controller that just dumps all the audio stuff into Sometimes a buffer. Sometimes you don't have DMA, you know, you have to Correct. learn how to do it Okay. Yep. This so, is awesome. All right. So people can learn all about this. You have a, a video or a tutorial? Yes. If they head to um, the uh, DigiKey's YouTube channel, they can see it. I'm doing the RTOS series. I think episode seven was just released. I'm going, uh, going to 12. Okay. And... If you give me just one second, I want to share share screen. I want to show this real fast. I will be quick. It's good old putty. And you can see me typing in putty really fast. And I can type RMS, and it gives me that. So nothing is slowing down, even though this is all doing the LED stuff while I'm typing. So everything's happening all, all together at the same time. Yay, real-time operating system. Yay, interleaving instructions. Good work, exactly. Sean. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so we come by next week for more real-time news, the real-time update from Sean. Thank you, Sean. All right, next up, it's JP, JP's Workshop. What's going on, JP? Hey, well, I just published a guide this morning on doing the MagTag Sports uh, Viewer, Schedule Viewer. If you can show my shared screen, I've got it uh, displayed here. And the cool thing is that now the date is correct. So. Yay! 
the date was off if the uh, game time was past midnight Zulu time because that's the the Greenwich Mean Time is what ESPN's API uses, and so my little hack together uh, date time thing wasn't aware of that. I was I forgot. So we now have actually a really nicely written library, the date time library that. Uh, was updated by Melissa to use ISO time, which is the time uh, standard that this happens to use. And uh, now we can see we've got a few games, we've got eight games in women's NCAA basketball happening today. Uh, this has dumped all the JSON data that we need to the device when it uh, does the download. And now it's really quick to update. It's just essentially the, the refresh time it takes a few seconds so we don't burn out our e-ink display. Yeah. And we can go through and see, oh, here's the next uh, game that was listed. Actually, this one uh, is final already, so it shows the score on it. You can go pick a bunch of different sports. So the guide will take you all through that. Uh, so that's what I've published the, the new guide on. And now I've got my new thing, which is what I'm going to be uh, working on tomorrow on John Park's workshop. And I, I went into part of this last week, which was uh, taking a Raspberry Pi uh, Pico microcontroller and turning it into a macro keyboard or up to a 27 key keyboard, actually. Uh, I built a circuit board for this that just uses a bunch of GPIO with these little key switches. This is a mechanical key switch here. Um, I built the, uh, the PCB inside of fritzing. And so a lot of people are used to the much scarier uh, world of uh, Eagle or KiCad, and they, they might find that to be a barrier. Well, I found actually that the Fritzing PCB design works pretty darn well now. I was able to do this uh, PCB inside of Fritzing and send it off to, uh, I got these at JLC PCB. I also have some coming from Osh Park. They're gonna be in the very cool uh, After Dark Black. And I have gone ahead and gone through a few stages of assembly, here's me laying out just with some uh, paper. I like to, to mock things up in paper that gives me the key spacing and make sure that all my keys are locked down before I solder them in. And uh, the, the big reveal, and we'll, we'll go into kind of the assembly of this, is this little macro keyboard I've built, which I'm gonna use for some different video editing tasks. Uh, but you could assign anything you want to the keys. It's in Circuit Python. Just shows up as a drive when you plug it in. It's real easy to go and edit this text file. So there's no need for Arduino or QMK or KMK or any fancy stuff. I'm sure those are cool, but this works really well right out of the box. Very very simple. There's no scan matrix. It's great looking. I mean, look at that. That looks Olivetti 100, you know, 101 style, right? Right. I, mean, I love these keycaps. Yeah. So I've got a couple different keycap styles uh, that I'm going to do stuff with. These are the uh, uh, the other ones that I've got DSA profile, but these are some. They, they call these ones teletype and they go in and out of production. They're they're from uh, Delvin Plastics and they're super cool. They have a great, great look to them. All right. Yeah, um, we want to do like the easiest like beginner keyboard project for like, you just got a Pico, you don't know anything about electronics, but you can make yeah. your own keyboard. And that's that's what you're yeah. gonna publish. Good work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and people will be able to follow that and they can hack it apart. It's actually pretty easy and fritzing to turn this into a four key keyboard or a three key keyboard or anything, whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. So. Awesome, can't wait. Thanks for being willing to tune into that tomorrow. It'll probably be a popular show. JP's workshop soon to be control of the keyboard. Next up, Trevor. Hey, Trev, what's going on this week? He's in an hey. alternate reality. He's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'll show you guys some AR stuff today. All right, so this is what I've been working on. Let me just, uh, share my video. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. This is AR app. Yes, this is Adafruit AR, and I'm going to show you what I've been up to. So I've been. Let's see. This is our uh, BLM board, and it'll as soon as it scans, there we go. It shows you all the components that's on the BLM board, uh, oh. and yeah, it's uh, working pretty well. Uh, uh, tracking is working really well, and if you turn it around, bam! Nice, that's so cool. Awesome. So yeah, so oh, wow, look at the that. angular. It, it totally cool. tracks with the angle too. I know. It's mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's uh, you know. Doing its job. It's, I love it. Yeah. It's cool. It's like people could be wearing it. You'd use that and it would like show up on the yeah, shirt. Yeah, it'll still show up on the. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I'm working right, on that. Cool. This is our workshop board that folks can check out. It's on Adafruit. And you can also go to adafruit.com slash Black Lives Matter. You can also go to the App Store and download our AR app. When we push this update out, you'll get this. We're adding new boards all the time. Oh, yeah. Nice work. Thanks, guys. All right, sweet. Thanks, Pedro. 
Hey folks, uh, so this week um, we have uh, the Fairy Wings as a guide in a video, so you guys can check that out. Um, yeah, so this is uh, running off of some feathers and a feather wing. Uh, it's programmed in CircuitPython. This was a collab project with Aaron St. Blaine. Um, I got the kind of crow style wings. I also got the, we also made kind of some fairy wings as well. These are made um, out of some Bristol board and cut up uh, on a, on a Cree cut vinyl machine. But you can also 3D print them, of course. And the point is to kind of make it like a platform for any type of wing. So if you got dragon wings or angel wings or you know, bird wings, um, you, they, they, can, uh, they can fit. <laughs> you can kind of swap them out. So we, we wanted to make them modular. Um, 3D printed kit, uh, prints without any support material, which I'm always jazzed about. Um, and yeah, they're, they're kind of the simple uh, take on, on uh, animatronic wings. Yeah, and they're really easy to reprogram. Like you can, you can use potentiometer, change the speeds, you can change how many times they flap. Yeah. Um, so I think it's like a, a building block for folks who want to add, um, you know, wings or like any kind of like back mounted appendages uh, to their cosplay. We did a long time ago, a um, animatronic tail that just wags back and forth. Yeah, so, that's true. Um, now you can be a, like a winged wolf. We'll yes, it. yes, you can uh, add some more appendages, have some ears and your tail. So yeah, it's our so second. We'll have all the appendages. It's our second wings guide. A million years ago, we did a EL wire one. So we have a how it started, how it's going, and we always, and we wanted to have an animatronic one, but we didn't want to have one that would be too difficult for people to edit and change very easily. Circuit Python came along. Now your wings show up as a USB drive, and you can just edit the yes. the code right there. All right, cool. Although you kind of look like a crow, sort of. I, I keep reading all these stories. I don't know if they're real. That people are like, I adopted a crow, and I trained it, and now it protects the entire neighborhood. Or I trained it to like get a job, and it like goes to vending no, machines. No, crow. Noah no, looks like a, you know he's like he's like a dark angel, but he's like your happy yeah. dark angel. I don't know. I don't know what's going also, on. Also, it could be a crow. A crow. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. All right, well, all right like, you know, you should wear this all the time. Yeah. I uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> all right. All right, all right, all right, folks. Coming next week. Okay, right, next Scott. up, Scott. You know what would be really funny is if two people had the same project and in one show and tell. We've had like four people to say, what are you talking about? So <laughs> if you had like a volume meter based on RMS. So <laughs> like wearing, <laughs> so no wearing the same thing the same party. It's okay. Yeah, so this is uh, the reason I'm showing it is that I just got PDM in working in CircuitPython on the RP2040. So uh, what I have here is a PDM mic. It takes a bunch of one-bit samples, and I we process it to produce a waveform, and now we're detecting the volume based on that. So no OS here uh, except CircuitPython. So we're just gathering a bunch of samples, computing the value, changing the LED, and then gathering more samples. So there is a bit of a gap between what we what we uh, record, but not much. Uh, it's going really well. It's using the PIO uh, and DMA. So that's uh, pretty neat. Yeah, really powerful. Cool. And what's interesting is, um, you know, we like PDM mics, but um, one of the, another, oh, hi, hello. Another thing that's interesting hi. about this is, um, you know, the TensorFlow uh, code for speech detection uses PDM microphones uh, for mm. input. So this, this could be like a stepping stone for us to do more machine learning um, on microcontrollers with Circuit Python as the front end to right. like models, because a lot of the times it's like, you know, you load the model and then you just call the back end TensorFlow. That could be, you know, the C code could be running in C, but then use Circuit Python to, to interface with it and get sensor data. Could be interesting. We'll find out. Yeah. Well, it did cross our minds when we were deciding how much to uh, leave in the flash for Circuit Python. Is like, oh, I wonder if we pick a Meg, maybe we'd be able to fit the the TensorFlow stuff in it. So yeah. Maybe. Uh, Good stuff coming. A lot of audio stuff in uh, Circuit Python for the RP twenty forty. Good stuff. Yeah, and lots of fixes too. Generally, so yes, uh, always keep on the latest stuff. It's it's improving a lot. And what's going to be your deep dive this week, Friday? Good question. I think I got a request to talk about the build system stuff I want to do, but uh, the thing that I need to do before that is all the Flash stuff. So I'll probably talk about how I want. Like I have a pretty big grand vision for like how we could have like one central location of all the data we need to know about different flash chips um, that we could then use Python to convert that data to all the different forms that we need it. Um, so I think I'll, I'll uh, at least talk about that this week other, or maybe even start it. Uh, all right. Yeah, my favorite thing about the JEDEC flash standard is not really a standard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like usually like what we have now is like, 
you can for a board you say this is the device I have, but that's all implemented in C. And there's a couple cases RB twenty forty and IMX where it's actually needed in a different form, uh, based on the boot ROM. Like the boot ROM needs to know it. So uh, having some other way that we can easily get into Python and then generate whatever form we need would be really nice. Um, right. So I'm going to start with that. Okay, sweet. Right. Thank you. Scott. Tune in this Friday for the exciting continuation. Yes. Yeah. And next week, next week will be Thursday. So okay. heads up on that. Okay, and then Thursday. All right, All right next so. up, Cy Y. Hey, hey. Hello. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Welcome. So um, a while ago, you actually shared a, um, a, 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 a contact uh, thermometer sensor on your NPI segment. Uh -huh. um, that actually gave me an idea for my project. Um, so my workplace actually requires me to um, conduct daily um, temperature measurements. Yeah, same um, here. Oh, okay. Um, and fill out a daily survey and whatnot. Um, so I actually built a, a Bluetooth, um, uh, uh, like, so I used the, the, the thermometer sensor and I interfaced it to a STM32 uh, Bluetooth module um, to actually um, do my uh, temperature uh, measurements. I did it just for fun. Um, you know, my workplace is not so rigorous about collecting the temperature data, but I wanted to, uh, you know, collect, do this for myself. Um, I got it working um, with the, um, I think the, the module is from uh, ST Microelectronics. I think it's called the uh, Blue Energy uh, module. Um, and um, interfacing the temperature sensor was quite straightforward. Um, I got the first prototype working, and now I need to build one with all without the headers, so that you know I could wear it as a pendant and actually start using it. Awesome! That's my, yeah, that's so cool. I'm glad that you like were able to take something you had to do and turn it into something you wanted to do. Yeah, and the Ion MPI series is why we show those things because that's why. You watch them. It's like, oh, well, that's a good, that's a neat idea, this neat chip. Like, what can I build with it? Yeah, yeah, it, it was fun. Yeah. Okay, right on. We'll keep tuning in and we'll keep trying to find good stuff so you can later build something with it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Next up, we're going to go to Joey and then we'll wrap up with Liz. Take it away, Joey. Howdy, y'all. Uh, so I've been hacking on this um, little baby circuit board, which is a kind of a brain replacement for this uh, Casio wristwatch. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually got one of them inside of this wristwatch right now. So if I can share my. Um, I can share my uh, QuickTime video here. Uh, can you all see what I've got here? Yep. Yep. Oop. One second. Hold on. There we go. Um, so yeah, uh, this is just running some very basic uh, code that I wrote. It's uh, counting up to 65,000. I can press the mode button to cycle through a couple of different modes, uh, red LED, uh, green LED, and uh, I'm not really showing it off very well. Green. <laughs> <laughs> green. And then the, the counter here. Um, but yes, yeah, so I've never really worked with these segmented LCD displays before, so I use this part called the SAM L22, which has a built-in segment LCD controller. Huh. And uh, what I'm really excited about is it also has native USB. So the board has a little cutout that you can plug directly into like a USB cable. And I'm currently trying to port this to, um, sorry, Really trying to port tiny USB to this so that you could actually reprogram it from your computer. It's got a little 3.3 volt regulator, so you can normally it runs off of a coin cell inside the watch, but when you plug it in, you can kind of program it once and then put it back in the watch and have it run whatever code you want it to run while it runs in your wrist for, you know, hopefully months. <laughs> um, it's a really low power microcontroller. It's like on the order of like 10 microamps while it's uh, mm -hmm. up in the screen and sleeping. So. Yeah, it's still really early days, but I think once uh, once I get Tiny USB ported to it, it's going to be uh, really exciting. We definitely need Circuit Python Casio watches. That would be so yeah. sweet. I I love that idea, especially with the addition of like the pin alarms and the um and the, yeah, the alarms similar. in general. Like, yeah, yeah. It might I'm not have paid every. It doesn't just work. I mean, this it's a Sam L twenty one. Yeah, it's a Sam L twenty. So now Sam L twenty two. It's it's a little bit different. It's the registers are laid out differently oh, from the Sam D or okay. yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll there. All right, cool. Well, if you need any help, post up in the tiny USB uh, GitHub and um, TAC has been super helpful getting you know all sorts of chips added, and we'd love to to get this chip added. And then, yeah, hopefully, you know, the, the rest of the support wouldn't be um, too tough. But yeah, it's always good to see. I, I do remember seeing the Sam L twenty one chips and being like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like very ultra low power. 
yeah. uh, Cortex M zeros. Really exciting stuff. Great. Yeah, all right. I love the segment. the segment driver is cool. All right, yeah. congratulations. People love hacking Casios. Great enclosures. All right, let's take it away. Hey, how's it going? Uh, tonight we're joined by uh, my cat Harriet and Jimmy. Um, but I've been experimenting with uh, some 3D printed uh, art um, to make uh, blank uh, Euro rack panels. Uh, so basically, you bring um, the SVG file of the art in, as a sketch on Fusion, and then you can extrude it. Uh, so I did this planet one that's uh, raised. Um, and then this one kind of ended up being kind of David Bowie style with the stars as a cut through, and then oh, um, the lightning bolts. And then I did a layer change um, for the filament swap rather uh, to get different colors. And then this one, Sailor Moon fan. <laughs> uh, so that's a Yusagi's uh, blanket that she has on her bed. So we got the stars and the moon and the, the bunnies um, all with uh, some uh, filament swaps. So it's just a little side art project. I love the texture. On. You know, it's got it, the depth of texture is really cool. Yeah, it's, I really liked how with this one you got the like different color effects, uh, but it still doesn't come out like bulky, which is yeah. nice. But the bunnies are raised, but that's it. All right, awesome, cool art. Thank you. All right, make some synthesizers. All right. um, Thank you so much, Liz. I no think that's Have a good one. Everybody. Yep. We got through everybody tonight. Thank you so much, right, thank you, everybody. everyone. Um, we'll be here every single week, 7:30 p.m. Eastern time. We'll either be Lady Ada and I, or sometimes we have other. Adafruit team members, stop by every single week. You can show your projects, retro stuff, pretty much anything that you've made or collected. Um, you can share it with us. It's the longest running show and tell. Ask an engineer starts in about five minutes. Thanks, everybody.